Our next speaker is Subhash Kantamneni, and he will be presenting stellar isochromes using non-local thermodynamic equilibrium conditions. Arguably, the most fundamental question in all of astronomy is how old the objects around us are. Answering this question for clusters of stars can provide valuable insight into processes such as stellar evolution. But it's infamously hard to calculate the age of stellar objects because no standard empirical relations exist that correlate a star's age to its observable quantities. One of the only ways, and by far the most common way, to calculate the age of stellar clusters is by using isochrones. Isochrones are gra graphs that plot stars based on their temperature and gravity. If enough stars of a common age and metallicity are plotted on a graph with these axes, we get a very distinct curve that corresponds only to stars of that age and metallicity. And you see here isochrones plotted for various stellar ages, where one giga year or GYR is one billion years. So stellar clusters generally consist of stars that were formed around the same time from the same interstellar dust, which means that they have the same age and composition. If we plot the stars from a stellar cluster on a graph with these axes, we should get an observed isochrone, which is shown here by these green dots for the stellar cluster NGC 1904. If we can match this observed isochrone up to a theoretical isochrone of known age, we can effectively deduce the age of the stellar cluster. But how do we create these theoretical isochrones in the first place? Using stellar models that simulate the life of a star given a starting metallicity and mass, we can take synthetic temperature and gravity observations throughout the lifetime of a star. And in this way, we can populate an isochrone graph. If we repeat this procedure for enough ages and metallicities, we can get a set of isochrones that can be used to calculate the age of virtually any stellar cluster. So these stellar models are based on the principle of thermodynamic equilibrium, which assumes that a region has a constant temperature and pressure throughout. So obviously a star as a whole does, is not in thermodynamic equilibrium because it has different temperatures and pressures as a function of its radius. But if we focus on a small enough volumetric element, we can assume a special type of thermodynamic equilibrium known as local thermodynamic equilibrium, or LTE. LTE states that in this volumetric element, the temperature and pressure do not change appreciably. So thermodynamic equilibrium can be assumed. LTE is valid in stars that are compact, like the sun and other main sequence stars where the atomic density is high enough for collisions to dominate, and these collisions constantly reestablish thermodynamic equilibrium. But in giant and supergiant stars that are older with lower metallicities and thus a lower atomic density, collisions are not as common, and radiation actually uh, dominates all other energy transfer mechanisms. So this radiation causes these volumetric elements to leak out energy, and obviously these energy leakages are difficult to model. The model that takes this into account are non-local ther non thermodynamic equilibrium, or NLTE, stellar models. So these NLTE stellar models are obviously considerably more complex than LTE stellar models, and because of that, very few NLTE models exist. And no theoretical isochrones using an NLTE stellar model have ever been created. The objective of this project was to use an NLTE stellar model to transform an isochrone from LTE to NLTE and analyze the properties of the transformation. So this NLTE stellar model takes in its parameters the observed spectroscopic data of a star in addition to the four parameters that define a star. They're shown here. The effective temperature, which is the surface temperature of a star. The surface gravity, which is a measure of the gravitational field strength at the surface of a star. The metallicity, which is a measure of the metallic content of the star, which is approximated by the iron abundance of the star. And the microturbulent velocity, which, which describes how the layers of a star move with respect to each other. If we compare the observed spectroscopic data to our stellar model for a given set of stellar parameters, we keep changing the stellar parameters until these two models match. And in that way, we can calibrate a star in NLTE. So an example of a star that I did this calibration on is the star HD140283, which kind of just sounds like a random star, but it's actually very famous. It's famous enough to have its own Wikipedia article, which is kind of, kind of rare for stars. And the liter it's very well studied. And the reason it's so well studied is because it's one of the brightest, oldest stars in the sky. So the literature LTE values for this star are shown here, in addition to my newly calculated NLTE values. And you can see the difference is pretty significant between the two. The temperature difference is almost 150 Kelvin. The gravity difference is 0.2 dex. The metallicity difference is almost 0.1 dex, and the microturbulence difference is 0.2 kilometers per second. So it's great that we now have more accurate stellar parameters for HD140283, but the problem is that this process is still really time intensive to do. It takes almost 20 minutes to calibrate a single star in NLTE using the MIT supercomputing cluster. And this computation problem manifests itself when we try to transfer an entire isochrome from LTE to NLTE. So this is one of the isochromes I showed earlier for an age 11 billion years and a metallicity negative 1.0. So obviously, we can't run an NLTE calibration on every point of this curve, because that would literally take forever. But what we can do instead is choose a set of sample points that roughly define the curve and run an NLTE calibration on those points only. And then from those transformations, we can get an intuition on how the curve as a whole would shift. So this is slightly complicated by the fact that this is a theoretical isochrome by definition, 
And thus, none of these data points are actual stars. So none of them have the observed spectroscopic data that serves as one of the inputs of the NLT model. So to circumvent that problem, we have to use something known as a grid. And the grid stores pre-calculated synthetic observational data on stars of temperature between 4,000 and 6,400 Kelvin in 50 Kelvin increments, in addition to gravities between 0.5 and 5 and 0.1 increments. So basically, we can only run NLTE transformations on points that are on this grid. So now the problem becomes choosing a set of grid lattice points that define the curve and are also fairly close to isochrone data points. So a set of 34 such points that I chose are shown here in red. And you can see these points aren't perfect. There's still some sections, like right here, where no points can be chosen because none of the points on the isochrone were close to um, grid lattice points. But for the most part, this shouldn't affect the transformation from LTE to non-LTE. So I ran the NLTE stellar calibration on these 34, 34 data points, and this is what we get. So this curve in blue that you're looking at right now is the first theoretical isochrone ever created using an NLTE stellar model. So this is where stuff gets really interesting. You can see that the vertical shift um, between the LTE and non-LTE isochrone actually increases as we move towards the top of the graph. And since the vertical axis is gravity, this means that stars with lower surface gravities have larger gravity corrections. And physically, this makes a lot of sense. A star with a lower surface gravity um, generally has an extended atmosphere, which means that they're a giant or supergiant star. And we said previously that the LTE approximation is not good for these stars. So obviously, the NLTE correction is higher for these stars. So we show the, the, the graph between the gravity correction and the original gravity here. You can see there's a rough linear correlation between the two variables. There's some outliers, um, like especially right there, that are dragging down the linearity. But overall, it's pretty clearly linear. And from this single isochrone, it wasn't clear if a similar relationship existed between the temperature correction and the original temperature. The difference between the LTE isochrone and NLT isochrone is really significant. And this is where things get really, really exciting. So this is the LTE isochrone for 11 giga years originally compared to the NLT isochrone. And these are isochrones of other stellar ages. So you can see compared to the difference between isochrones billions of years apart in age, this LTE to non-LTE transformation is very significant. In fact, we can approximate the change between LTE and non-LTE as a difference between isochrones 2 billion years apart in age. So if this LTE to non-LTE discrepancy held for other stellar ages, what we've been estimating to be a 7 billion year old stellar cluster using a 7 giga year LTE isochrone it's really only a 5 billion year old stellar cluster using a more accurate 5 giga year non-LTE isochrone. Because of this, we could be overestimating the age of stellar clusters by billions of years. So obviously, this should be seen as a critical issue in astronomy. And we have to create more NLTE isochrones from previous LTE isochrones for different ages and metallicities to account for this. Um, another thing that we can do it's more to make the NLT transformation even more accurate, we can use 3D stellar atmospheric models instead of the 1D stellar atmospheric models used in this um, project. The only problem with that is that these models are like an order of magnitude more computationally intensive than the already computationally difficult 1D stellar models. But as computing power increases in the future, um, this should be seen as a future avenue of research. And the last thing that we can do is investigate the gravity correction, the relationship between the gravity correction and the original gravity, in, in addition to the relationship between the temperature correction and the original temperature. If we can find linear relationships that uh, define these two sets of variables, we can essentially convert an isochrone from LTE to NLTE really simply using these transformations instead of running the entire NLTE calibration process like I did. And this would allow us to make the problem of creating more NLTE isochrones much more tractable, because isochrones are too fundamental of a tool to astronomers for these uh, large inaccuracies to be present. So I'd like to thank Dr. Rana Ezzedine for being an overall great mentor, for being super helpful and patient throughout the research process. I'd like to thank Dr. Anna Frebel for proposing the research topic in the first place. I could thank Paul Sai for helping me when I crashed the MIT supercomputing cluster. <laughs> I, that happened twice, actually. I'd also like to thank Dr. John Rickert for giving me great presentation advice throughout the entire process. Thank you so much, actually. Um, and lastly, I'd like to thank CE and MIT for allowing me to join the RSI family. Uh, thank you so much. We will now take questions from the judges. So I'm curious, do you have yeah. ground truth? I mean, yeah. You said this is for describing red giants. Uh, do you have clusters of red giants that are all expected to be the same age that you can compare to your isochrome? Yeah, we definitely do. The only problem is that I only finished this computation like a few days ago, and the time restraints restrict us from doing actual observational studies. But that's obviously the next step. Sure, OK. And then a second question yeah. is, um, is there some sort of benchmark for these models? Like, are there stars <laughs> whose age we understand extremely well that we can compare these to, or is it all just models to models? Comparison? Yeah, right now, it's only models to models comparison. The reason we can't choose a single star is because we actually have no way to calculate the age of just a single star by itself. We can only calculate the age of stellar clusters, and using that, we have to use isochrones. But this is kind of like the first step in that um, transformation. So we can't do much right now. All right.
question about yeah. the choice of points. Okay. Go back to that yeah. Uh, okay. One more. Okay. Yeah. So why are your points unable to run on the grid? Yeah. So there are these um, three green points right here. Um, they, these models cannot run on the grid. And that's because that was a problem with the grid. It's not a problem with any of the points. The models on the grid for these stellar parameters were non-converged, uh, which basically means we just couldn't run the NLT calibration on them. But I mean, it's just three points, right? Because since we have such a larger sample size, this really shouldn't affect the overall trends that we see. Yeah. Do you have any idea why there are some of the crosses also? Oh, like right here and right here? Yeah, so actually, I have no idea why there's some of these crosses. Um, maybe that's an error, because there's so many, like, for every calibration, uh, there are multiple sets of stellar parameters that are returned as possible candidates. And we have to obviously make some cuts using some conditions to choose the optimal set of stellar parameters. But maybe that, that set of conditions is not uh, completely accurate yet, and that's why we have some of these crosses. But physically, they really shouldn't be there. Yeah? Um, so the, the LTE models have been uh, presumably calibrated based on uh, some assumptions about the ages of certain uh, clusters. So you were talking about uh, t uh, being two billion years off in, in our age. Yeah. How do we know that the age is the problem and not the, like presumably if LTE was calibrated, then maybe the maybe it's the, the relationship between uh, various parameters that are wrong. It's actually the metallicity or, or something else. That's okay, so the question was, um, how do I know that it's the age is the problem, not some of the other parameters? And the reason is because we can observe these other stellar parameters for stars like pretty, pretty well. We have really well-defined relationships that allow us to determine the metallicity. Um, to allow us to determine the temperature and the surface gravity, what we don't have is a relationship to determine the age. Because that's the most uh, uncertain quantity, it's, it's best to assume that that's what's off here, if that answers the question. OK. We will now also take questions from the audience. Um, could you please define metallicity? Yeah, um, so let's go back to metallicity here. Ooh. OK, so metallicity is a way for us to, um, it's actually, metallicity traditionally is the percent of a star that's made up of heavier elements than hydrogen or helium. But we use this metric known as Fe over H. Um, we approximate the metallicity of a star by using its iron abundance because it's really easy for us to calculate iron abundance compared to other elements. And um, the units of that, we compare the iron abundance of a certain star to the sun. So we all, everything is a reference to the sun in a logarithmic scale. Can you speculate as to why the NLT model performs better than the LT model? So the question is, why does the NLT or why is the NLT model better than the LTE model? And really, it's because the input physics of the NLT model are just better. So if we both solve physics problems and you're solving a projectile motion collision, <coughs> taking into account air resistance, and I'm not, then we can say that your answer is going to be more accurate because you're more accurately uh, modeling the system that we're dealing with. And that's the same thing with NLT and LTE. to overload the MIT supercomputing cluster? Yeah, so the question is, how did I manage to overload the MIT supercomputing cluster? So in order to cover a single star um, in NLTE, I have to run 2,500 models uh, for various stellar parameters at the same time. And I really shouldn't be doing that in the first place. But one day, I was like really like impatient, and I ran 10,000 models at the same time, and that didn't go well. Yeah. Uh, so does the NLTE transformation like, return on a unique solution every time? Is there like, some kind of optimization that can play? Yeah, so the question was, does the NLT, um, the NLT calibration return an, uh, a unique set of parameters every single time? And like I said before, no, it actually doesn't. There are multiple sets of stellar parameters that are used. Um, this NLT model outputs a set of, like, of errors for every set of stellar parameters, and we're just trying to minimize those errors. But there are multiple sets of parameters that have such minimal errors that we can't really differentiate between the two. And in that case, we have to go to the spectroscopic data, the, the synthetic spectroscopic data of the star. And whichever spectroscopic data has the lowest standard deviation, that has the most accurate spectroscopic data, that's the set of stellar parameters we use. That's obviously maybe not the best way to pick the best set of stellar parameters, but we have no other solution at this point. So that's what we have to do. Um, could you please elaborate on the significance of the delta values that you got? Like, why, like how significant are they in terms of like changing what astronomers previously thought. Oh, this is a supplemental slide. <laughs> OK, one more. All right, so you're talking about this graph right here? Go back to your, uh, your table with all the, yeah. yeah. So how significant are those values, like 140k and like, or? OK, so the question was, how significant are these changes in stellar parameters? Um, I mean, considering that this, the temperature of a star is about like 5,500 5, Kelvin, this is obviously like non-trivial. 
Um, but like I use this example just to show that there's a pretty significant difference between NLT and LTE. It's not really that important for us to have the most accurate set of cell parameters for a single star, but it's, it's really important for us to have the most um, accurate set of isochrones um, to calculate the age of stellar clusters. All right, thank you, Subhash.